Good afternoon from Taipei. I am Ben Blanchard. I'm the Reuters Taiwan Bureau Chief. We are very happy today to have Minister uh, Audrey Tung, Taiwan's Digital Minister, joining us for Reuters Next. Uh, Minister Tung is a self-described civic hacker. She joined the government in 2016 at the age of 35, and I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, you were the second youngest ever appointee to the cabinet in Taiwan. Uh, you're one of the most sort of prominent supporters and uh, proponents of Taiwan on the international stage. So we thank you for joining us today. Uh, if I could go straight into the, uh, the, the interview. Uh, next week, you will be representing Taiwan at uh, President Biden's Democracy Summit, along with Ambassador Xiaobi Kim. Uh, could you give us a flavor, perhaps, of what you're going to say at that summit and sort of explain to us why you think it's so important that Taiwan has been invited to participate? Definitely. Um, as the State Department and our Ministry of Foreign Affairs have uh, already shared with the journalistic community, uh, this will be a focus on the human rights and the advance that we make on democracy, especially during the two years of the pandemic and infodemic. I believe uh, the fact that we have countered the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedown shows that it's not just about defending democracy in the struggle against authoritarianism, but also about advancing democracy so that the citizens and the governments can enjoy more mutual trust, beginning with the governments trusting our citizens. So, obviously, there's a lot of international attention on Taiwan at the moment because of the increased pressure that China is putting on Taiwan, whether it's military or diplomatic or or uh, political, and, and as you know, the Chinese government is very angry that that Taiwan has been invited to participate. W what's your sort of reaction to that? I mean, sort of, where, you know, there's the, this mm -hmm. constant mm -hmm. pressure from China, and, mm -hmm. and especially the fact that they are so mm -hmm. angry that you are going to be participating, mm -hmm. and that the, the Taiwan mm -hmm. government has been invited to the democracy mm -hmm. summit. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I think this is the, the first uh, round, right, of the summit for democracy. But it's not going to be the last. There will be, in the future, more summit gatherings for democracy. So for uh, all the uh, governments and peoples around the world who feel uh, maybe slighted that they have not been invited as a participant, my suggestion is to double down uh, on realizing democracy so that maybe by the next round uh, we will be sharing the same stage. So you're basically saying that China really should democratize if it wants to um, if it wants to be invited to summits like this. This is a summit for democracy, so obviously uh, the participants are all the entities and governments and so on working to advance democracy as, as I call it, a social technology, which gets better if more people advance it together. And, and Minister, are you actually going to Washington for the summit or will you be participating virtually? Well, as a digital minister, of course, it's natural for me to appear digitally as we are uh, having this conversation now. Uh, but I also understand that um, pretty much all of the participants uh, will be digital. Okay. Now, Minister, one of the, the, the things that you are most well known for in Taiwan is about participatory democracy, about radical transparency, uh, openness. We obviously exist uh, in a time of extreme disinformation on the internet. Uh, the Taiwanese government complains frequently about disinformation uh, that, that spreads in Taiwan, and a lot of it, they say, comes from China. Um, how do you tackle this? I mean, what is the sort of overriding, your overriding strategy for tackling this? And do you believe that you're winning the war um, against China, I suppose, for uh, for? when it comes to disinformation? Um, the height of the disinformation campaigns uh, was during 2018, 2019. But leading up to our presidential election, January 2020, uh, we have adopted two strategies. Uh, one is called notice and public notice. 
which means instead of taking anything down, when we notice that there were, for example, a trending rumor that's going viral about painting the protesters from Hong Kong as, and I quote, rioters that have been paid $20 million to murder the police, end of quote. Uh, all these, of course, are not taken down, but uh, we work with independent fact checkers like the Taiwan Fact Checking Center and so on, members of the International Fact Checking Network to uh, trace the origin of that alternate caption. Uh, so we soon discovered uh, by the independent journalists that a photo was real and it was a Reuters photo. But the original Reuters caption uh, says nothing about being paid or murdering police. It just said there were young protesters in Hong Kong. So the alternate caption came from the Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei Chang'an Jian, the Chang'an Sword, or the Central Political and Law Unit uh, from the uh, Communist Party on the Weibo account. So instead of taking this message down, we just made sure that on the uh, social networks and so on, uh, where this message is being spread, there is this label uh, when you share it that says, you know, this is sponsored uh, by the Chang'an Jian as discovered by the Taiwan Fact Checking Center. So it's not uh, to inhibit um, the virus of the mind, so to speak, but rather to make inoculation, immunization, so that we develop kind of antibodies. It's like a mRNA strand to stretch the metaphor a little bit, uh, so that we uh, can actually repackage this disinformation into something that enhanced the resilience and uh, immunity of the entire citizenry. And we also use, of course, humor over rumor, uh, like the very cute spokes dog, Zong Chai, a Shiba Inu. So pretty much all the Central Epidemic Command Sanchez counter this information. Posters are based on this very cute dog, uh, an internet meme, basically, that spreads even faster than outrage. So a lot of this, Taiwan obviously is, you know, we're, it's a, we're a free society here, we're a democracy, freedom of speech and stuff. Uh, you know, people are very passionate users of Facebook, of Instagram, uh, of, of Twitter. It, but China uses, is increasingly good at using these, these platforms, which are, of course, ironically banned in China themselves, to sort of spread its message around the world. We saw last week, for example, uh, Hu Xijin, who's the uh, editor of the Global Times, was busy attacking President Tsai for, on Twitter uh, for meeting the Baltic uh, lawmakers. I, I mean, do you think that there should be more regulation of social media, to, especially sort of in the case of China, really to prevent them from abusing these tools? Well, I believe Twitter uh, also adopt the same public notice um, policy when it comes, for example, to label the state affiliated or sponsored accounts. Uh, but more than that, I believe to advance democracy, we need to build our own pro-social social media uh, in conjunction with the um, democracies around the world. For example, in Taiwan, the join platform, which enjoys more than 30 million visits uh, in a country of 23 million, so a lot. Uh, that was uh, basically based upon Beta Rekavik uh, from Iceland and Kansu and Desidima uh, from Spain, from Barcelona, and so on. And so all these international contributions on how to make a pro-social social media made sure that we have the digital equivalent of town halls and public libraries or university campuses in the case of PTT, Taiwan's Reddit equivalent, but with no shareholders or advertisers. So people understand that to talk about public issues, there are those digital town squares to talk to, so we're not forcing our citizens to only have such conversations on the digital equivalent of, I don't know, nightclubs or the entertainment sector, which would be like Facebook. Uh, uh, thank you, Minister. That's, that, that's a very interesting point. One of, the, um, one of the sort of comments that you're very famous for, you have a very dry wit, you, you like, you're talking about using humor to counter some of... Um, Rumor, yes. <laughs> counter, using humor to counter rumor. Uh, I remember in 2019 you gave a very witty response to a German reporter uh, mm -hmm. when you were asked about uh, when did, you know, about mm -hmm. Taiwan. The Neolithic age. age, yes. Yeah, exactly. But it was in the Neolithic period that Taiwan broke away from China. Do, do you think that in the, the sort of the international discourse around Taiwan, there's too much focus about trying to connect Taiwan to China, and that sort of means that Taiwan's own achievements, own story, is more difficult for the outside world to hear. 
Well, when it comes to digital democracy, uh, and as I mentioned, countering the pandemic, countering the infodemic, and so on, uh, I don't think there's uh, so much uh, resistance, right, in the entire world to hear such messages, what we call the Taiwan model, or Taiwan can help. And in these contexts, I mean, how to counter this information using humor or using notice and public notice is so drastically different than the uh, social media that is sponsored by the state in more authoritarian regimes. Uh, so in these conversational contexts, I don't think there's a risk for Taiwan to be confused with some nearby authoritarian regimes. Yeah, does it frustrate you personally that if you look at international media coverage of China, it, it's, it's often, especially at the moment with the pressure that Taiwan is facing, that so many of the stories from Taiwan and about Taiwan are ultimately stories about China? Well, as I mentioned, uh, in my domain, uh, which is digital democracy, social innovation, open government, youth engagement, and so on, uh, I have not run personally uh, into such conversations. And since you mentioned, I think it was the Deutsche Welle, right, the DW interview, um, I think I only spent maybe two seconds answering that particular uh, question about the Neolithic age, uh, but the remainder of the conversation, oh, sorry for that, let's, let's redo this part. Um, okay. okay. All right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my line of work, which is open government, social innovation, and youth engagement, uh, when working with international journalists and correspondents, I, I don't think there's a lot of confusions here. And the story was almost never uh, about uh, the Taiwan slash Beijing uh, relationships, but rather, as I mentioned, about Iceland uh, or about Spain, about Japan, about the US, and so on, how those democracies are learning from each other. And so I believe that uh, when the Deutsche Welle DW journalist asked me the question about, I think it was a Hong Kong and digital democracy, I only spent a couple of seconds uh, kind of brushing off, right, the question uh, about the so-called breakaway province, saying that, you know, it's broken away since the Neolithic age, uh, and then the remainder of that interview was all about the topics that I just talked about and had no uh, bearings about the Beijing relationships. Right. So, uh and, and, and when you are attending the, um, uh, the the democracy summit next week, uh, when when you when you're talking about China's uh, sorry, Taiwan's story and and uh, but about also disinformation that comes from China, I mean, what do you really want the what do you want the world to know about the situation that you're facing here, um, and what lessons do you want the world to take away from your experience and what you've been doing in Taiwan? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a summit for democracy, right? So while we also talk about how to struggle against authoritarianism or disinformation or the pandemic for that matter, ultimately it is about treating democracy as a kind of social technology that all can contribute to. So it's not just about every person contributing three bits of information every four years called voting, uh, but rather in a continuous way through uh, petitions, through the sandbox applications, presidential hackathons, participatory budget, referendum, I can go on. Uh, all these ways are to increase the bandwidth of democracy so that the government can respond to people's needs in the here and now, but also more importantly, new innovations can thrive instead of having to wait for four years. So to shorten the iteration, to make democracy more rapid, more here and now, I believe is my main message. And what are the areas that still sort of concern you about democracy uh, in, in Taiwan? And, and sort of what areas do you think you personally in your role still need to improve upon in Taiwan? Definitely. Um, I think, broadly speaking, uh, there are two uh, main um, challenges that we're tackling. Uh, one is how to get what we call good enough consensus, people's broad agreements on the common values 
in a more predictable and a more quick fashion. I mean, when it comes to fighting the virus or fighting the kind of foreign meddling on our election, of course there is common value in the entire citizenry. So it's rather quick uh, to go to the innovation stage rather than just talk about the consensus. But if you uh, look at our recent uh, referenda discussions, it's quite obvious uh, that because previously all the referenda were tied to election cycles, so it naturally takes a more kind of partisan, more polarized tone of conversation. And this is actually the first time that we can treat referenda as the subject matters by themselves instead of tied to particular election cycles about politicians or political parties. So a culture around a more deliberative tone of democracy to get a good enough consensus going, um, I think that is the, the main challenge. And we're starting now uh, with this current referendum to start to build such a more conversational and deliberative culture. And the second challenge uh, is people who don't even have a vote in the referendum or elections, right? People younger than 18 uh, are responsible for more than one quarter of citizens' initiatives in our joint GOV.TW platform. And many of the most uh, impactful suggestions, like banning the plastic straws in our signature during the bubble tea, came from people younger than 18. So how to make sure that people People younger than 18 think about democracy as something in the here and now that they can set an agenda together and even lead the country's directions before getting the right to vote, I believe is also very important. Uh, Minister, I think we're, we're almost at our time limit. I have just... It's okay. I, I don't have anything afterwards. <laughs> you, you can keep doing this and I we can edit it, it down. I have, yeah. I have just one question, which is a slightly lighter question. I know that sometimes in your interviews you like to use the Vulcan expression, live long and prosper. Um, from your personal point of view, you know, Star Trek, you know, it's seen as this sort of utopian society, something that was very ahead of its time when it came out in the 1960s, certainly in terms of things like interracial relationships and stuff. Do you think there's a lesson from Star Trek for Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely. Uh, I, I use the Vulcan salute uh, because I believe it's a catchier way. Uh, I can also talk about um, to sustain and to develop, right? Sustainable development. Uh, but to sustain to me means, well, live long, right? Intergenerationally. Uh, and uh, to have a development, of course, is to prosper together. So to me, this is, uh, I, I used to wear a pin here, right? The SDGs pin with all the 17 colors uh, that talks about the sustainability and development, not as two uh, diametrically opposing things, but as two things that can be joined together and in a shared vision so we can advance sustainability and development together, advancing the uh, future generations without sacrificing the uh, current generation and vice versa. But uh, it's uh, very long to say, as a mouthful to say, so I've shortened it to simply, well, live long and prosper, which to me uh, symbolizes sustainability and development. And in Taiwan, um, previously, um, it's quite easy to portray a public conversation around a, for example, public construction as kind of a trade-off between sustainability on one side and the development on the other, right? The environmental and the economic interest are seen as in kind of this tug of war. Uh, but now, using uh, new ideas, uh, including impact investment, circular economy, and things like that, we are now seeing new innovations that can advance those two values together. So it's not only a lesson for Taiwan to learn, but also in the spirit of uh, building back better and taking care of our planet, uh, net zero emissions and so on. This is a lesson that I think all should learn. Uh, uh, Minister, is there a particular Star Trek character, for example, Spock, that you have found personally inspirational mm -hmm. in, your own personal, in your own personal journey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I found the entire world building uh, to be inspirational. I can't say that I identify with any particular character, uh, but of course, Live Long and Prosper, I first saw it from Spock. Uh, Minister, uh, thank you uh, very much for joining us today. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Live long and prosper.